I'm, I'm really delighted. I want to introduce all of our guests who are here with us today, starting on the far side, Archbishop Richard Gagnon, who is the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Winnipeg. And thank you. Um, and here representing the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, Richard and I were the co-chairs of the task force that came up with the study guide um, that we have been using across our church that based roughly on from conflict to communion and have also um, helped map out the plan for the 17 different um, services of common prayer that will be taking, across, taking place across the country this fall. So welcome to you, Archbishop Richard. We have the Right Reverend Jordan Cantwell beside Richard, and um, Jordan is the moderator of the United Church in Canada. We're very delighted that you are here with us. Thank you very much. And no stranger to the ELCIC, we have the um, Reverend Cannon. Cannon. Is there a doctor in there too? Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Alison Barnett Cowan, who, who, who has, in, in, has worked in many different um, uh, ways uh, across the international and ecumenical scene, but for a while was the ecumenical officer of the Anglican Church of Canada and saw us towards on the journey towards full communion. So she is well known by, by many of us. It's a delight to have you here. Alison is the president of the Canadian Council of Churches. And we have um, Dr. Catherine Johnson beside her. Catherine is the director of, is that right? Ecumenical and Interreligious. Ecumenical and Interreligious, director though, right? Of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Before she took on that role, or maybe one before that, but Catherine served as the director of ecumenical affairs in the Lutheran World Federation, and so was the staff person responsible for the international Lutheran Catholic dialogue from the Lutheran side, and saw us to the point of the writing of From Conflict to Communion. So she's played a, a pivotal role in terms of getting us to the place where we've been able to have these services of common prayer and jointly think about how to commemorate the Reformation. So we thank her for that. A new friend to us, the, the almost newly elected moderator of the Presbyterian Church, Reverend Peter Bush, um, who happens to live in Winnipeg. Uh, so we're glad that we didn't have to make you travel too far to be with us, but uh, we're glad very much that you're here and look forward to working with you in this next year. And of course, you've already met Willard Metzger Church Guy. That is the name of his blog, so it's okay <laughs> to call him that. The Executive Director of Mennonite Church Canada. We already heard a, a really fine sermon from him on the opening night, and we all know that he is in possession of a really good quality winter coat now. <laughs> and No, I didn't knit it. <laughs> I said good quality. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> and, and of course, last but not least, we have uh, our Fred, uh, Fred Hiltz, the, Arch, uh, the primate of the Anglican Church of Canada. So I want to say a word of appreciation to all our guests. They all have incredibly busy lives and schedules, and the gift that they have given to take time out and to be with us at our convention is huge. Um, I just know how much energy it takes uh, to, to travel and to stay in another place and get to used to somebody else's system. So um, I, I hope that in some ways this can also be a blessing to you, but know for sure that it's certainly a blessing for us, that you honor us by being with us in this way. So thank you very much. So this is how, this is what they are prepared for, and then we'll see what, it, what happens, okay? <laughs> But I've asked them to each speak for five minutes total on um, one or both of these questions. What is the significance of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation for your church or your church council? And secondly, what are the implications for ecumenism going forward for the next 500 years? If all of that goes according to plan, it will leave us with about 40 minutes for conversation between the panelists. After that, we're just gonna turn it into conversation. And if we have extra time after that, we'll open it up for questions from the floor. And we haven't yet announced the speaking order, but I'm going to give the honor to our Roman Catholic colleague on the far side to begin. 
or burden, we'll see. <laughs> it's, you get to interpret it your own way. And we'll just come across the table. I think that's easiest, especially with the passing of microphones. So Richard, would you please be so kind? Thank you, Bishop Susan, for your very warm and, and uh, kind remarks. Uh, on behalf of the, uh, do I sit or do I stand? What am I to do? Um, I think you can sit. I'm, okay. I'm gonna come sit with that you. That sounds good. <laughs> On behalf of the Archdiocese of Winnipeg, uh, I'd like to uh, bring greetings to all of you at this convention. And uh, I understand it has been uh, fruitful and a good convention so far. And so I wish just simply to bring you our, our prayerful support from the Archdiocese of Winnipeg. And uh, this topic of the uh, fruits of the dialogue coming from the Reformation is very timely, very important uh, for all of us all of us believers uh, who are centered uh, in our hearts on the prayer of Jesus, who prayed for the unity of his disciples. And so this is very important work. It's a spiritual work and an important work indeed. Um, my working with uh, Bishop uh, Susan and other members of the, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church and <coughs> members of the Catholic Church on this special project um, to commemorate uh, the Reformation and the various workshops that have ensued from it has been a very enriching personal experience, I would say, uh, from the standpoint that we entered this work not knowing how we were going to do it and, and how it was going to unfold, but with, a, with, with an open heart. We, opened, we entered this work with an open heart, and I, I noticed that one of the ecumenical imperatives in the document from conflict to communion kind of sums that up very nicely. We begin from unity. So we realize that we have a lot in common and we grew to appreciate our gifts, our common gifts together. Uh, we, we, we grew to be good listeners to one another, to have patience with one another and uh, to see that, uh, that this is part of a long history of dialogue. And uh, it's very uh, edifying and heartwarming to know that on the local level, the parish level, the church level, there have been gatherings uh, on this topic based on the various uh, topics that came from that national dialogue on the commemoration of the Reformation. So I think that, um, you know, considering all of this, Dialogue is so very important, and where do we go? Where do we go from here in terms of, of this? Well, you know, it's spiritual work, and it's spiritual ecumenism uh, to recognize the graces we have in common and the privilege we have in common as being disciples of Jesus based on baptism and faith. And the spirit of, of dialogue, being good listeners to one another, honoring the gifts that each other have, uh, recognizing what we have in common. This, this is very powerful. And it's okay, you know, at a national level and at other kinds of levels where this is common parlance. But at the local level, in the pews, uh, there's much education and much formation that has to occur. And I think that is one of the positive, the positive possibilities. According to the, the will of God and the influence of the Holy Spirit, uh, to, to, to build on that dialogue at the local level so that uh, Catholics and Lutherans can pray more together, can dialogue among themselves and together, and to have common, common projects uh, to work on which comes from their discipleship, meeting the needs uh, that present themselves in our modern society. So dialogue was one of the, the key the key points of the, of the Second Vatican Council and uh, our experience at the national level, um, Together in Christ was the name of the project, was a good demonstration of that. So we begin with love, eh? Begin with love, not a feeling, but a, but, a, but a determination, an act of the will based on knowledge and faith of who we are as disciples as a first step, a respect based in love together. And I think this is something, too, that we need to work at at all various levels of our church. 
There's, there's an immense responsibility in the part of, the, of leadership, on my part as the Archbishop of Winnipeg, to, to help our priests, our lay people, to be informed and formed in ecumenical principles. And that wonderful document from Conflict to, to Communion, there's a lot there. It's powerful. And in a sense, you know, it speaks of the Reformation. Now, that's, that 16th century reality, that's, that's done. We, we've, we've been through that. And, and we've come a long way since then. You know, and how are we going to now build upon the good, positive dialogue that has occurred since then? So this year, this commemoration with the Holy Father going to, to Sweden, the dialogue that occurred there, what has happened nationally, these are all powerful things. And I, I hope they're not let go of. At the level of leadership, we have forged good friendships and respects for one another, and that's a positive thing as well. So I think that's how I would initially um, address the, the topic at hand today, uh, that's, that's placed before the panel. And just to tell you that it has been personal growth for myself. I've seen growth in my own archdiocese and a great interest in this question. And you know, when you consider the number of immigrant peoples in Canada, in the Catholic Church, there's, there's a lot of immigrants. You know, the Reformation is a, is a reality they're not really aware of at all, you know. But what went off the rails, where some of the divisiveness came from and the causes, is a lesson for today that we can take for today as well. So I want to express my deep gratitude for the invitation to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jordan? Thank you. Um, when I think about the church reformed and always reforming, um, and, and 500 years in particular, makes me think about what was going on 500 years ago at the time of the First Reformation. And it was a time when Europe, Christian Europe, was um, deep into its colonial project. And the churches were central in that colonial project. And so as, as the Reformation was being born, it was birthed uh, right within the midst of that colonial European mindset. And I think it's important for our churches to take stock. 500 years is a significant anniversary. And so to look back at how we have been shaped um, in, in all kinds of ways, good ways and, and not so good ways um, throughout our history, but particularly to say we were born out of colonialism. It's, it's in our DNA. And that has had a tremendous impact on how we have been church here in Canada and how we have uh, been on the land and with the peoples of this nation. And so five, when I think about the next 500 years, I think, what if we were to rebirth ourselves in a post-colonial or decolonized mindset? What if the work of the next 500 years for us as churches is to celebrate that which is tremendous gift in our churches and, and, and what we have been and known and done and shared and learned, but to also take stock and to say, what, do we, what needs reformation? And, and I really think that that the, the colonialism that is in our DNA, that is at the heart of our understanding of church, of how we do theology, of how we understand ourselves, that needs to be reformed. And we are at a moment in this country in particular where I think that there is a desire, a will, and I believe by God's grace the ability for us to actually begin to unpack and turn away from the colonialism that has, I would say, infected our churches. I, I come from the United Church of Canada, and in our first apology to First Nations peoples that we made 
just over 30 years ago. The then moderator, Bob Smith, he said, we did not recognize in you the creator's image and the gifts that the creator had given to you. And because of that, God's image has been twisted in, and blurred in both of us. And so the Reformation that I think the next 500 years, and, and it will probably take us that long, the next 500 years call us to rediscover the image of the Creator in each one, and the, and the heart of the Gospel. The heart of the Gospel, when it hasn't been married to a particular culture and a particular colonial mindset. What does the gospel look like when read again through the eyes of those who were the first ones to hear and embrace it? The oppressed, the poor, the occupied. That's the context in which Jesus lived and preached and shared the gospel. And, and it is the context, I think, in which the gospel is most clearly understood. And so the work, I believe, for our churches as we are ever reforming, and the work that we must do together, we must do it ecumenically, is to look closely at how we have confused the gospel with a particular culture. And in fact, I would argue with a particular skin color. We need to examine how we have twisted up the gospel and in the process twisted up the image of the creator in us and in everyone. And to allow ourselves to be taught by those who understand what it is to be the occupied, to be the oppressed, to be poor. Allow ourselves to hear the gospel anew and to discover again, perhaps for many of us the first time, what it is to truly be liberated by the gospel, liberated to be what we are meant to be. That's my hope and my prayer for all of our churches as we move forward, as we seek to live out in our time, in our moment, the call to be a reformed and reforming church. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to speak principally uh, from my position within the Canadian Council of Churches, which is 25 member churches, uh, including everybody who's represented here and many more, um, for whom, some of whom are churches of the Reformation, uh, some of which uh, do not uh, like the word Reformation. Um, because their ecclesiology is such that the, that the church is the body of Christ and is pure and holy and does not need to be reformed. But it always needs to be renewed in the Holy Spirit. And so I think about the Reformation, in fact, as a renewal movement. Um, Bishop Muni said uh, yesterday um, that Martin Luther wanted to bring renewal to the, to the church. That was his gift in the Holy Spirit, to bring renewal to the whole church. And I believe that most of the schisms that have happened in Christian history have been because those in power at the time, for all sorts of reasons, didn't recognize the gifts of the Spirit that were being sent to them for renewal. Um, speaking as an Anglican, I can say I think we made a colossal mistake with Methodism, which was a, an attempt to renew the spirituality and faith of Anglicans in the 18th century. Uh, we pushed them to the margins. And, and drove them out to our peril. And we are now in the process of, of our international dialogues and locally trying to recover. Could we start that conversation again, please? Um, and, and learn from you the gifts that you were trying to share for our hope and for our renewal. So I would say that when we talk ecumenically across that great spectrum, that's a theme that everybody can recognize. Because whether you actually date 1517 as meaning anything at all, um, or see it as something that those Western people were getting up to. Um, we, we all need renewal, and we all need the marks of the Spirit. And I would hope that our next 500 years, if we manage to all live on this planet for that long, which 
God only knows, um, is a stretch, um, that, that we will be constantly keeping our ears open for the voices of renewal, which almost always come from unexpected places, not from places of power. Um, the second thing I want to say is I, I am so impressed by the way that the Lutheran World Federation chose to make this a commemoration and not a celebration, and that you chose to make it an ecumenical commemoration. This is just an enormous signal of hope for all of us in the ecumenical movement because we don't want to celebrate winners and losers, as, as your bishop has said to you in this, in this convention. That's not what it's about. All of us hear the Spirit differently, and we all have something to contribute um, to its hearing. And part of what we need to hear is to hear our history again in a different way. I was privileged to be in Stuttgart when the apology was made to the Mennonites. I, I can't tell you, that was the most powerful moment I think I've ever had in my Christian life. The, the fact not only that Lutherans apologized, but Mennonites, God bless you, accepted it. Um, <laughs> but that was in the context of hearing the voices of those who were persecuting and persecuted at the time. It was in the presence of those witnesses that that apology was made and accepted. And I think it's the same spirit that has brought Catholics and Lutherans to commemorate this. And it's an opportunity now perhaps to tell the, the story of the Reformation differently and together. Incidentally, the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics have a dialogue at the moment. They are trying to tell the story of the first millennium together, and they're having trouble. This is, this is not an easy business. We so much define ourselves by those moments when we weren't them, um, and we were better than you. Uh, but this commemoration says, no, we have to do that differently. And, and that, I think, uh, is a signal for us to pick up on, on Jordan's theme. Um, that we as Canadians need to tell our history differently. And we're just beginning to realize that. Um, we need to be renewed in this country, and we know that. And we can only do that when we listen to the voices that need to express themselves for as long as they need to accept themselves until they say, we think you've got it. So I think your, your example is an example not just for church, but, but for country and for world. And I'm so delighted to have been a part of these, uh, of these commemorations. I had the feeling last night that Bishop Yunnan was giving part of the little talk I might give now when he talked so eloquently about the spirit of Lund. I think it's fair to say from a Lutheran point of view that this was a hope we had that exceeded our expectations. I remember at the LWF when we began to talk about this 500th anniversary and hoped that it would not do damage in the way that triumphal centennial anniversaries had sometimes done by pouring salt in our old wounds and continuing to define ourselves by opposition. But that looks, in retrospect, like much too small a hope. I think we have experienced a Reformation anniversary year that was commemorated deliberately and not celebrated, I think now we get to celebrate that this ex so far exceeded our expectations that we have not only not done further harm, we have actually discovered and worshiped together and stepped forward into an, a reality that has changed beyond our capacity to have imagined even a few years ago. Bishop Susan said yesterday that most of us would not have imagined 50 or 10 years ago, even five years ago, that this 500th anniversary year would begin with an inauguration that was co-hosted by the Pope. As symbolic actions go, that's a biggie. And I think the reason that the spirit matched the symbolic quality of that action was in part what Allison just talked about. And that was that this, the Lund event, which took its title from a dialogue, hard one, paragraph by paragraph, comma by comma document, called From Conflict to Communion. When that became worship, the worship had three foci. The first was thanksgiving 
for the faithfulness of God that had led us to new insights into the gospel that we could, Catholics and Lutherans together, give thanks for. In the heart of it was repentance. And only out of that thanksgiving to repentance came the commitments at the end. I think, at least when I tell the story, I'm convinced that we Lutherans learned the central power of repentance in healing ecumenical relationships afresh from our experience with the Mennonites. That was, I would agree with Allison, it was an extraordinary moment in 2010. Um, when Lutherans looked at their heritage and said, there is nothing here we can do but repent. And I think these repentance muscles need practice uh, to give up the, well, lots of bad things happened in those older centuries we know better now, or we could have done better based on our own insights. We just didn't have a good day that day. Um, but to say there is nothing we can do but repent to live by the grace of God that we proclaim. Cardinal Casper, who at that point was president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, walked out of that service in Stuttgart and said, if this is the spirit we can bring to 2017, we can move forward together. And I think we did. So that was a colossal reset, I think, in a number of ways. I didn't know the story Bishop Yunan told about the interfaith implications. I want to pursue where that has happened. In our American experience, um, I just did what I try not to do in Canada, in the US. <clears throat> <laughs> in our experience as the ELCA, um, we wanted to contribute to this. And so we took up a suggestion by Lutheran Ecumenists and by Cardinal Koch, the su successor of Cardinal Casper at the um, PCPCU, that what we needed to do was claim how far we've come in dialogue on issues where we haven't gone all the way. So we took up the, the big unresolved issues of church ministry and Eucharist and tried to say we're not all the way to where we might get with something like the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, but we're not nowhere. We've come a lot further than we might have guessed. And in fact, the, the Jesuit um, in his 80s, who was one of our task force members, at the end of it said, I began my life studying Martin Luther in the 1960s at the time of Vatican II. And as we have worked through these issues, I have seen how far we've come. And it is so much further than I thought. So we asked our church, we asked the ELCA to claim that. And we thought this was sort of an ecumenical action. And as with <coughs> others, as with the Mennonite action, as with Lund, that moment in our assembly was another of those absolutely memorable points in life. Because what we expected were questions on the specifics of the 32 statements of agreement on church ministry and Eucharist that we had identified. What we got was speaker after speaker hoping that by taking this action, we could change the way we live together. We could move forward more closely to the time when we could share the table together. We could live differently in families in communities, in college classrooms, in relationships between spiritual directors and, and those who are directed, in friendships. So when the time came for our vote, and we were hoping for 80%, with no theological questions at all, that had happened in the Conference of Bishops, and I think a lot of our synod delegations worked this out with their bishops. 99 point something percent of our thousand voting members said yes. And they did that because they wanted us to take the title of that document, which was Declaration on the Way, and in particular to take the image that was on the cover, which is an image of the, uh, in Asian art, um, by the Chinese artist Ha Cha, except it doesn't sound like that when he says it a beautiful image of the road to Emmaus. That we were on the way in the presence of Christ, even when not fully recognizing Christ among us. And we know where that story ends. That's the way our people wanted to be on. 
And the Catholic members of that task force looked at us Lutherans and said, we didn't know you Lutherans cared so much about moving toward unity. And we Lutheran members of the task force said, we didn't know that either for sure. But since then, we have seen that work itself out across our, our country in the synods where, like you, we are using the Lund Liturgy, where we are having uh, study groups in congregations and at synod levels. And what we hear is something that bears witness to what General Secretary Martin Junga calls the double accountability of Christian leadership. We know that we are accountable to God to work for the unity that we know God wants for us. But those who lead churches have an accountability also to the people who bear the costs of disunity. And where are those costs shown? They're shown in families. When at a funeral, someone cannot receive the Eucharist at the funeral of a family member. They're shown in our witness. When we bear witness in an increasingly pluralist world to how we love each other, well, look. Those who bear the cost hold accountable, have an accountability claim. And I think the joint statement that was signed at Lund by Pope Francis and by Bishop Yunnan claims that. We acknowledge, they said, our joint pastoral responsibility to respond to the spiritual hunger and thirst of our people to be one. What we have seen in this anniversary year, I would say, is the depth of that hunger and thirst and the energy that could propel us to change. So I would say to Lutherans, seize the moment. This is the moment when we have the attention of us as we think about Christian relationships. We have some uh, attention in the world. Find the places you can go forward. And as that joint statement said, be bold and creative joyful and hopeful in local communities, in church groups like this, and throughout the world. We have moved further than we thought and not as far as we could. I want to thank you for this opportunity to be with you, and I bring you greetings on behalf of the 2017 General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. I'm going to stick close to my notes so I don't go over time. But I want to start with a historical comment. I do think that the five solas of the Reformation will be as robust in conversation 500 years from now as they are now, as they were 500 years ago. I think that the five solas still will be important. A piece of historical data that will not exist 500 years from now is that denominations as we experience them in North America will not be around 500 years from now. They are an experience of the 19th century and they are a part of modernism and I think that they are on the way out as a structure that we know today. But having said that, I also want to comment that all of us on the stage here and all of us in this room share a common heritage prior to 1517. We are all part of the same branch of the church. And we do not have anyone on the panel today who represents the, the whole other branch of the church that historians awkwardly call the Eastern Church, well, we're the Western Church. I don't like those names, but they're the shorthand of the moment. And so I refer to the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Churches, the Coptic Church. Ten years ago, when I came to Winnipeg, I introduced daily prayer in a Presbyterian church. I know it sounds a little weird, but we did it. And in that first year, an attender, regular attender of daily prayer came to me and said, who are these Coptics people that we pray for all the time? That's 10 years ago. I don't think there's an attentive Christian of world events now who would be asking who the cops are, right? We, ex we recognize their profound commitment and faith, even though we may not know who they are. But in this city, in this city, they have a large presence that we should not ignore. Second, 500 years from now, there will be new indigenous branches and denominations of the church at the table who are not here now. When I use the word indigenous, I'm not referring just to First Nations and Inuit people here in Canada. 
I'm also talking about grassroots indigenous groups around the world. For example, the explosion of the African initiated churches, like we have here in Winnipeg, Deeper Life Bible Church, which exists in 25 congregations across this country, including in Winnipeg and in Brandon, which is an African birthed, African created, African driven denomination. And they're not alone, there are dozens of them, and they're gonna be coming out of Asia as well. So the conversation 500 years from now will have a very different face that is not present at this table right now. And we may say that we are open to world Christianity, and I do believe that we want to take it very seriously, but sadly our Eurocentrism creeps in so easily into our attitudes and our thoughts and blocks us from having really serious conversation with our world Christian partners on a deep and profound level. And thirdly, there is a split in the family. I don't split maybe too strong a word. There is a two sides of this family that started about 100 years ago called the rise of the Pentecostal movement at Azusa Street. And they're not here either. And they, going forward, will have to be important conversation partners with us, with the entire church. They are part of this church, part of the church. And we will need to have very different, sometimes difficult, but certainly challenging conversations with them. When I talk to my Presbyterian colleagues about these issues, I often say that we have learned that the ecumenical dance is a lot of fun, but often the ecumenical dance we have with is with people who are our cousins, right? When I dance with the United Church and with the Lutheran Church and with the Anglicans, they really are cousins, right? Nice and safe, but really rather boring, <laughs> right? To dance with your cousins rather boring? The exciting conversations and dangerous ones are with people who don't know our dance moves and may step on our toes. And moving forward, we will have to be prepared to get our toes stepped on and develop thick enough skins to have serious conversations so we can learn to dance with people whom we find both odd and exhilarating at the same time. Thank you. Well, when you're at the, uh, the back end of a long line, yeah, and some, so many good things are being said, you, you either are fearful that everything you wanted to say has been said, and if it hasn't, then you really start to have serious doubt about <laughs> what you... <laughs> well, for us as... Um, Anabaptist Mennonites seeking reform is key to our identity. And I think the problem is that my notes just jumped on me. The problem is if identity is locked into Reformation, then we will always need something to react to or we want to reform. I remember in 1998 when I was. Um, probably just in high school, something like that. Uh, when our, but when our two, when our... <laughs> Slow learner! <laughs> but our, our two North American denominations, we had a general conference, Mennonite Church and Mennonite Church, and they were two different um, migrations of people. They were in the midst of talks of amalgamation, and it did happen. But one of the reasons to amalgamate um, that was articulated was to ensure our continued influence. So some of our delegates in those conversations were lamenting that other denominations were becoming as strong a peace witness as we were as Mennonites. And so rather than celebrating that we may have had significant influence and prompted societal religious change, 
this was seen as losing our distinctive identity. So we needed to come together to strengthen our voice so that we could outpiece the other peace <laughs> movement witnesses. Seemed a little odd, like the need to be able to boast that we were more humble than anyone else. But I think that will be one of our biggest challenges as churches of the Reformation. It might well be to recognize that after 500 years, we may now need some reforming. I think we have a youth and young adult population ready to be our reformers. So can we embrace their prophetic presence or will we resist them? In our own denominational tribe, we have been experiencing a great interest in Anabaptist principles. Uh, so there, are, there has been an emergence of what we're calling neo-Anabaptists. <laughs> a, young, a young generation attracted to Anabaptism, but not wanting to join into their historical Anabaptist expressions like Mennonite Church Canada or Mennonite Church USA. So there is a sense that as a 500-year-old expression, we have lost the purity of the original Anabaptist movement and become too much like mainstream Protestant Christianity. I'm not sure, no, no offense intended. You know. <laughs> oh boy, I didn't think that one through. <laughs> So this can be seen as a threat or opportunity. Neo-Anabaptists express Anabaptism in ways that we have not. They're discovering it in a new way. They are not inaccurate expressions, but they are different ways of articulating what we already know. However, whenever something is articulated in a new way, it has potential to bring a new and fresh appreciation and embrace of that common knowledge. So I suppose there is always the challenge, this is always the challenge to the norm, to view challenges of new expression uh, as a threat or as an opportunity for that continual renewal. And I think that will be a, a challenge for us. I think the second challenge is that denominational distinctiveness, which really is a key Reformation outcome is probably at its lowest level of value for the next generation of leaders. In fact, I think youth and young adults see disagreement as a value, not as something to be tolerated or something that is less than the ideal. It's actually seen as, as an ideal. And that agreement is actually suspect. So what does that mean for, for historical denominations that have put a lot of value and emphasis on being able to agree together. I think that will be a challenge for us. I think of um, uh, Phyllis Tickle, one of the, um, the futurists that, that keeps saying that the church goes through a major change every 500 years, and here we are celebrating 500 years. And so what does that look like? And was certainly articulating that as we heard uh, last evening, bringing the Bible into the hands of ordinary people was a huge part of the change that occurred 500 years ago. And there was a change in, in where people understood authority so that it came from the clergy, perhaps, to the ordinary person as they understood the Bible. So the Bible became that place of authority. And Tickle is suggesting that that is now shifting again not that the Bible is being discredited, but, but that it is how that Bible is now understood within, within community. So it's community discernment that is being predicted as perhaps in the next 500 years will be that place of authority. I was sharing that with a group of students here at the University of Manitoba about a year ago. And so there's about 20 of us gathered together, and I said, so that would be that if this 20 of us here, we're a group, we're a congregation, that we would have authority over each other. And one of the students said, no, 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 no. 
not authority, accountability, not, but sort of, but um, flexible accountability. And so I said, well, that's kind of interesting. So tell me more. What's flexible accountability look like? And, they, and he said, well, that would be that you have the authority to ask me any question that you want. That's the mutual authority and accountability that we have. But not to dictate what I do or do not do, but you can ask me any question. Well, I thought, well, that's, that's intriguing. I kind of like that. But that will be very different for us in our congregational life. And so I think that's one of the challenges. What will, what will that look like, and how will we be able to embrace a different understanding of the truths that, that have been guiding us for, for many years? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in terms of uh, three uh, lasting gifts, gifts that keep on giving, uh, from the Reformation, uh, for me, I would identify three. One is um, that we're called to proclaim uh, the fullness of the gospel. We're called to embrace the priesthood of all believers. And we're called, indeed, to be a church that can recognize its continual need uh, for reformation. Those are gifts that come to us, I think, from Luther's teaching, from the Reformation movement, not only on the continent, but across England. And as we think of the Reformation, it was not just what happened on a particular day uh, in 1517, but it was actually a movement uh, that, that took, uh, spanned a number of decades. Um, I uh, am a great uh, uh, ambassador for this document from the World Council of Churches, uh, the Church Toward a Common Vision, produced by Faith and Order uh, in 2013. And, and in that document, uh, there's a very clear reminder to us that the church is a creature of the gospel and that a defining aspect of the church's life is to be a community that hears and proclaims the word of God, drawing its life from the gospel and discovering anew the direction of its journey. That's paragraph 14. Paragraph 4 in the same document talks about the church's evangelistic vocation manifested, as the paragraph says, through its life of Eucharistic worship, uh, intercessory prayer, a daily life of solidarity with the poor, through advocacy even to confrontation with the powers that oppress human beings and destroy creation. So one of the gifts, it seems to me, that comes from the Reformation as I look at our own church is, is indeed a fresh look at evangelism. And um, inside the Anglican Communion, there is much talk about evangelism these days. There is much rehearsing of the different approaches to evangelism uh, for which our communion has been known. Attraction evangelism, have beautiful liturgy and open the doors and everyone will come. Outreach evangelism, which says... Well, what we do beyond the walls of the church is equally as important if we're going to be faithful to the gospel. Uh, a number of years ago, Michael Ingham, the bishop of New Westminster, wrote a book, and in it he talked about a sensitive evangelism in which um, a sensitive evangelism, he says, is diaconal rather than imperial. Harken back to some of the language we heard a little further down the panel around colonialism and colonial attitudes. He said it's designed to serve and not conquer the souls of those whom we deem to be lost. Lots of talk in the Anglican Church of Canada and throughout the Anglican Communion about the most effective form of evangelism today. And many of us would contend if we listen to Luther's teaching um, that the most effective form of evangelism is in fact a, a community of faith that is truly living out uh, the fullness of the gospel. And at the heart of that, living out the fullness of the gospel, is, I think, a renewed understanding of what it means to be a disciple. And I think that's, that's what Martin Luther was, was getting at in a lot of his teaching, too. Can we, can we examine afresh what it means to be a follower of Christ and not just a, quote, member of the church? So discipleship, we're, we're realizing as we look 
back at the teaching and the continuing gift of the Reformation, uh, discipleship is, is something that touches uh, every aspect of our lives, uh, from the way we worship to what we read and study, uh, to how we're engaged in our communities, to the political choices we make, and to the way that we actually uh, care for the earth. Now, for Anglicans, that broad sense of um, understanding discipleship is reflected in our marks of mission, and with many, many other churches, it's reflected in the vows uh, that uh, attend our covenant uh, in baptism. So attending to those vows, it seems to me, is at the heart of the continued reforming of our church in accord with Luther's strongly held views around the priesthood of all believers. And so one of the gifts of the Reformation that continues, it seems to me, uh, to, to grace the church in terms of its conversations about ministry, as the WCC document talks about, uh, that making it clear that the royal priesthood of all believers rooted in the New Testament teaching and a special ordained ministry that signifies the priesthood of all believers and the diaconal ministry of all believers with both important aspects of the church. And as that document says, they're not mutually exclusive alternatives. And as to the wider implications of the Reformation, I think Luther's teachings will always call the church back to the gospel. We heard that last night uh, in Bishop uh, Muneeb's address. We've heard it several times across the panel. And it will cause the church to be renewed in accordance with its precepts. And I want to say that um, I'm a great admirer of Pope Francis. I admire his writing. It is, it is appealing. It's, it's easy to read. It's dense, but it's easy to read. It's thoughtful. It's provoking and it's challenging. In his first encyclical, uh, Evangelii Gaudium, The Joy of the Gospel, Francis speaks at some length, actually, about Reformation. And I just want to conclude with a couple of the paragraphs because I, I think that they speak right into this conversation. Citing Paul VI, he writes, the church must look with a penetrating eye within herself, ponder the mystery of her own being." This vivid and lively self-awareness inevitably leads to a comparison between the ideal image of the church as Christ envisioned her and loved her as his holy and spotless bride and the actual image which the church presents to the world. This is the source of the church's heroic and impatient struggle for renewal, the struggle to correct those flaws introduced by her own members which which her own self-examination mirroring her exemplar Christ points out to her and condemns. The Second Vatican Council presented ecclesial conversion as openness to a constant self-renewal born of fidelity to Jesus Christ. Every renewal of the church essentially consists in an increase of fidelity to its own calling. Christ summons the church, writes Francis, as she goes on her pilgrim way to that continual reformation of which she always has need insofar as she is a human institution here on earth. He goes on to talk about a missionary option capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably uh, channeled for the evangelizing of today's world rather than her own self-preservation. And then he very boldly uh, encourages every particular church to undertake a resolute process of discernment, purification, and reform. So as we think about those words from Pope Francis, as we think about... Um, Luther's teaching and the long-lasting impact of the resurrection, of the, the resurrection, maybe it was a resurrection, <laughs> of the Reformation, um, it seems to me that uh, we're hearing again and again what Bishop Muneeb uh, so eloquently spoke of last night, and that is the discipline, the discipline of always allowing ourselves uh, to be reformed in accordance with the precepts of the gospel that we proclaim. 
And that, for me, is the most lasting gift of the Reformation. That's the one that is the gift that keeps on giving new life to the church and its vocation, as the WCC document says, to be like its Lord in the world and for the world. Thank you all so very much. Let's give a, a round of applause. So already such rich and diverse um, presentations, we really appreciate it. Now I'd, I'd like to invite you to continue the conversation and if there are things you've heard each other say that you would like to make a comment on or reminded you of something else, or if you have a question, let's talk amongst ourselves and uh, I'll try and help that move along. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm curious on, uh, on the statement that you think um, um, that the, ref or the denominational structures that we have are something passing. Um, and then, because I've, I've certainly thought of that quite a bit and, and, and wondered, um, and yet isn't there, like there's, doesn't diversity somehow, won't it somehow realign itself differently then rather than, uh, so what, what do you think will, might replace the current structure? I, my comment is very much aimed, yes, at the, at the Protestant side of the North American experience. And our denominational existence in North, North America Protestant experience is very much arising from a modernist, industrial, corporate kind, corporation kind of approach. And as we move to postmodernism, as those realities happen, we're going to come up with something that's not as structured as the way it is. We have moved in many ways denominationally from having a product that we created called mission, so we're no longer a corporation that creates mission, we have moved in many ways to a regulatory agency, and I think that as we move to postmodernism, that's gonna collapse. And what we're gonna see arise instead is the rise of communities, I mean geographical communities, finding ways for people crossing what we call denominational lines to find ways to be community church in their context. And so that the real heart of ecumenism going forward is not going to be at this level. It's going to be at the grassroots. Um, my brother argues now that all politics is local, and I would also argue that real ecumenism going forward will also be local. And so the structures that we're used to will evaporate because it will be driven by new creative models at the grassroots where church or community in this community, the way that's built will be very different than the one 20 minutes down the road. If I could comment on that, I, and I've, I'd like to say that one of the problems with the ecumenical movement is its success, um, that I think that younger generations have complete permission, have, think they have complete permission to move wherever they want to, and they simply ignore the rules. And God bless them. If they go to a place where they can be nurtured in faith, I really don't care what name is on the, on the church door. Um, and I think in that sense, uh, that generation isn't going to mind as much. Or if they take their Lutheran identity into another community, they still, they'll still be Lutheran in their core, but they'll bring that gift to others. Uh, but the other, the other piece of the landscape, of course, and we've alluded to that this morning, is that now everybody's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Every local community um, across this country probably has refugees of some place or other. Um, they may be Christian, they may be not. So local community also it looks very, very differently to what it did even 20 years ago. And I, I can't figure out what that's going to mean for people of faith to get together across differences, um, to be people committed to the values of faith in a postmodernist, secularized world, because the value of, of faith, I think, will trump anything else. And then what do we do? Then we have to have all the real interfaith ecumenical conversations 
in a very local place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'd want to echo what Allison said, that it's, uh, there's a, a global dimension as well as a local one. And I think that change is coming at all these levels in very interactive ways. So yes, there's a, a real local uh, working out of what it means to be Christians in a place or people of faith in a place. But think of the impact that Pope Francis has had on the whole world. That is the most prominent Christian in the world right now. And most of us Christians think that's what Christian faith looks like, someone who is so joyfully living out the invitation to seize the mercy of God. That has game-changing implications. On a smaller scale, um, say within the Lutheran family, the companion synod relationships among our churches have changed our local ways of understanding what it is to be church much more than we expected, I think. So that in each of our ELCA dioceses or synods, there is a tie many times to an African diocese. And that brings home the concerns and the perspectives and the lives of those people, even when they're not present in the local population. I think this works in really complicated, up and down in every which way, um, movements all at the same time. I'm just gonna say, um, I always have trouble understanding how one can separate faith from culture <laughs> because your culture is how you is what you speak through so it, it's you know it's not a matter of, of uniformity but it's a, it's a matter of the diversification of of human expression but the gospel being itself such a powerful force of 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 of, of change of conversion of the human heart that cultures are changed through the gospel but you, it's hard to separate. And I think as far as the younger people uh, are concerned, um, certainly in, in my experience, I've noticed that, um, yes, a lot of young people say they believe in God, and it's quite private, it's quite personal, and uh, no reason to believe it's not authentic by any stretch of the imagination. But one, one of the challenges, I think, is is the knowledge of Christian community, uh, the experience of Christian community. They don't know what it's like to share a life together, even though we know communities are far from perfect because we have our personalities and characteristics and so on and so forth. Sometimes it's quite challenging. But uh, the community, someone made reference earlier about the evangel the power of the evangelization from the community, and that's that's the experience of the early church. Um, so how do, you, how do you today in this digital world which, and, and, the, and the philosophy of, uh, of individualism today, materialism, how do you share with the next and younger generation the beauty and the importance of a shared common religious life? You know, so... I think that that's one of the little ingredients today that uh, I think is missing. And I've had, it's not my idea, I get this from what university students tell me, is what, they, what their experience has been, the lack of the experience of community. You pray together, you play together, you're human together, but in the middle is this, this beautiful gem of faith, this common faith that... Uh, that we've discovered with the commemoration of the Reformation. The beautiful gift now that we have, we've acknowledged, we've recognized it. Now, <laughs> implementing it. Always the issue. Thank you. All right, folks, that now gives you some time for questions. Is there anyone who would like to comment or question any of our panelists? Microphone one. 
Hi, so I don't really have a question, but I kind of have a comment slash story. So for the past five years, even though I'm a Lutheran, I've gone to a Catholic school, and I remember entering grade seven there, and basically all the way through these past few years, it's been, I was very concerned about like doing the sign of the cross and goodness when they brought out the rosaries. I didn't know what to do because from what I had been seeing on um, like a local level was, oh, you just stick to what you know. Lutherans stick with Lutherans, Catholics stick with Catholics. You don't have to worship with them or anything. And getting to come to conventions like these and getting to see that on such a wider level, we as a church, like as the whole Church of God are looking to come together. It's really, really exciting. And I just want to thank all of you guys as leaders in the church for looking towards this stuff because as a youth, it's something that I wish I would have known sooner so that I could have worshipped more with other people my age who were from different denominations. And it's really just really exciting as a youth for myself to see this going on. And I'm really excited about what this means for the future. Could you tell us your name and your synod, please? I just forgot about that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited. Uh, Trinity Fusick from the Saskatchewan Synod. Thank you. There you go. Microphone one. Uh, Roy Tahudial, uh, Bethesda Lutheran, Eastern Synod. Would like to thank the panel for such informative and stimulating discussions on this topic here. Um, I was uh, very much caught by the Reverend Jordan's contribution in terms of uh, the place of, or the role of colonialism in the history of the church and the gospel. Um, and um, I think, uh, as we heard last night, and even from the Reverend Jordan, and this, this force is still at work in uh, the church in various shapes and forms. Um, we talk about Reformation, and um, I think one of the things or the principles at work in the Reformation was that getting back to the original, which may have become somehow misformed along the way, um, if we go back to the early church, we see that there was a challenge for the church there. And we asked, the question was asked about how do we proclaim the gospel in an age of uh, digital technology and our time? Um, the church in its beginning spread and grew because the Christians, those who were in Christ, spread the gospel. They witnessed. And we can, and perhaps technology gives us an even greater tool to do that kind of witnessing. I think one of the things we have to understand, that I understand anyway, is that the early church the Christians went out, and I use this word guardedly, and the second time I'm using that term, and conquered the world for Christ by sharing the good news. In the 15th century and there on, through colonialism, political powers went out and conquered people in the name of Christ. And that's a big difference because denominationalism was exported to those conquered people and imposed upon them. Nevertheless, history has done what it has done. I think what we have to do going forward, as the church, is to do what the church is. What has brought it from the beginning to this point is what will take it forward. The church, our challenge is to be faithful to the gospel and our call to discipleship and open to the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone two. Uh, Fred Nolting, uh, Eastern Synod. Um, I'm a little bit curious when you say uh, um, that the uh, church is going to change in 500 years. And I, I get the impression that more or less 
we're all going to join together a little bit more. Uh, would it be sort of like now we have, you know, we already have uh, community churches, uh, sort of non-denominational churches, uh, sort of Pentecost Pentecostally type churches, if you will. Were you thinking along those lines or? or uh, <laughs> Well, let's, let's take small rural communities. Before I came to Winnipeg, I served a community called Mitchell, Ontario, a community of 3,600 people with six churches. And at the time I was there, we were all doing okay. Do I think that 25, 30 years from now, there will be six congregations in that city, in that town? No, I don't. And I think that the amalgamations, the connections, the linkages will be very surprising. They'll be unexpected. And I think we need to be prepared for that unexpectedness. The other th fundamental thing I think we will need to see is that as we realize that there are Syrian refugees across the country all over the place, and there are gonna be more refugees and more people from, more settlers who are first generation settlers um, arriving, who come as Christians. You, you realize that today, still, at least half of the, of the immigrants to our country are Christians. Right? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you got that. Because when I say that in my circles, this room says, what? You gotta be kidding. No, they're Christians. And they're gonna seek to worship in our buildings with us. And they're gonna change our face. And they're also gonna push us in ways that are unexpected. So that I think that's entirely possible that in 25 or 30 years in Mitchell, there are two or three congregations who have multiple relationships at the national level who are figuring out how to do ministry where they are and who then go together and share common things they do together in their place. And they probably won't have on the names Presbyterian or United right. or Roman Catholic right. even maybe. Right. Right. They probably won't have any of those names, not even a hybrid there'll be something completely different that's community-based. I think that's the way forward. Thank you. Microphone one. Just this uh, response to what Reverend Bush said. I'm not putting him on the hot seat here, but just uh, something he, I wanted to get some reaction maybe the Hold whole panel Hold on a sec. From. Tell us who you are, please. I'm Harry Hobbs. I'm from the MNO Synod. And Peter was alluding to the fact that most of the, the people on this table are, were cousins. And, and he said that some people aren't part of the conversation. The example, one example I know he gave was Pentecostals. And we have some other people who, by some standards in the middle lectures, aren't even worthy of calling Christian because their, their, their beliefs are very different, even though they would say they are Christians. I know in our ministerial association at home, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons are not invited because they are considered to be too different in their views of, of, of what, what uh, Christianity is. Although if you ask them, they would say they're Christian. And my question to the panel is, how do we even begin to get those kind of people into the conversation who seem to believe in Jesus and in God in a fundamentally different way than the rest of us? One of the other uh, things I love to do is uh, work with a group called the Global Christian Forum that is an effort precisely to bring to the table new churches and old churches in about equal numbers. Um, whether or not this is a good structure for every place is, is a complicated question. But it's the discovery of, of that group when it meets that the place to start is with story. That if we tell stories of our relationship with Jesus Christ, where the challenge implicitly to each other is, do we see the face of Christ? Do we hear the working of the Spirit in this community? Do we see the face of Christ in this person? That uh, expands the table by playing away from the, the familiar turf of churches like ours that have tended to want to start with belief statements. Um, it also builds relationships that allow hard questions like uh, proselytism among newer churches and older churches to get on the table. It does not take completely off the table the question of what happens if you cannot say yes to that question. And, and I think there are times when, although I, I'm very uncomfortable about this and uncertain when, um, 
but there are certain uses of the Christian story in, in defense of uh, Christian identity, for example, where I, I want us to be able to say, this is not an ecumenical challenge. This is something different than that. Um, but I, I think that kind of beginning from experience is one way to start. Microphone one. Yes, uh, Eldon Danielson from Saskatchewan Synod. I am one of those examples that were as a, as a Lutheran deacon uh, hired by the Catholic community in a Catholic home to be director of spiritual care. I've been there seven years. The first year or so, it was a little bit rocky because we don't always understand each other. But after that period of time, it has developed into uh, an excellent relationship. Uh, and each of those, the, the people that I'm dealing with our older generation of people have come from each of the lines that they were, whether they would be Catholic or Lutheran or Mennonite or whatever, have, once they get into the home, they realize that this is my brother and sister living here, and we begin to change. And in that changing, we begin to take down a lot of those lines. And then you add to that in the health situation in Saskatchewan anyway, where you have people from India coming to work as, as nurses, and you have Sikhs and Hindus, and, and, uh, and then you add the, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses to the nursing home as well. We have a, a tremendous opportunity to un understand each other as, as Christians and as individuals. One of the nicest things that, that I have found is that in the Catholic community, they treat me like a deacon. In the Lutheran community, we have quite a trouble deciding what that means and what that, what that term is. <laughs> when I'm in the Catholic community, I am treated uh, as if they, they think we, we kind of know what we're doing. <laughs> when I go back to my own home or outfit, we have to study the facts for years and years and years to determine if we can do anything. My problem is then, uh, or not problem, actually I'm celebrating all of you people uh, at that table. Uh, we have uh, the Mennonite Church comes, Ryan Siemens, who you, uh, is a good friend of mine, who has just been an excellent job with us. Uh, we have uh, the United Church, Nora, we have, and each of those people who come to that community recognize that we are all together in this and, and uh, Bishop Albert, who is the Catholic bishop, is just tremendous in order to accommodate that. So I just wanted to say to you as a, as a, as a group up there that you are in our homes, in nursing homes, in, in Saskatchewan, in, in, Sask in, uh, in Prince Albert. Thank you. Microphone one. Mark Harris from the Eastern Synod. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin by by thanking the panelists for the, uh, for the wonderful feast of uh, perspectives and ideas that you brought to us today. Um, I was wrestling, or, or goodness, feasting on, on some of the, a, a number of the comments that were really summed up for me by Bishop Hiltz when he said at the end of his presentation, he mentioned, used the phrase, allowing ourselves to be reformed. And that for me cap, uh, cap, capsulized something. Uh, because I think um, all of us want reformation on our terms, <laughs> when in fact uh, reformation is the spirit's project, and we probably work against it as much as we work for it. Um, so I would really appreciate some of your perspectives on the way that we, as, as members of institutions, and Marx reminded us that institutions are inherently self-serving. That as members of institutions, what are some of the things of which we need to repent or relinquish um, in terms of our institutional ecclesial identity uh, if we are to be open to the Spirit's work among us? Who would like to step forward to answer that? I think one of the things that we need to 
um, question is whose voices we privilege in our churches and um, on panels. Uh, who, who's, whose truth resonates for us and whose kind of sounds just weird. And probably it's those weird ones that we need to listen to. Because the ones that resonates, those ones are familiar. Those ones confirm what we already know, which is one story. For most of us, it, it's the dominant story of our church that, that our church tells. And it's those other voices that just seem like they're talking weird. We need to learn how to listen to those voices. And so I, I think that's one of the practices, is to examine whose voices get privileged um, and why, and to be very intentional about privileging, which means those of us who usually talk become silent and silent listeners, not just silent with our fingers in our ears, but silent listeners. And those who seem to be just talking some kind of weirdness get really listened to until we can hear truths that's, that currently are too strange for us to hear. I think that's it's probably just a good practice in life, actually. Thank you. Richard. I, um, I like the term uh, uh, to give permission for conversion. I think that's a, a, a kind of a neat uh, thought, actually. And the gentleman also said something else, that the Reformation is a project of the Holy Spirit. Well, it is now, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> those are good things. That's, those, those, are, those are very thought-provoking. I think, um, you know, what Jordan was saying, too, the uh, listening and, and the dialogue piece, which is becoming more and more prominent, leads each individual Christian that comes from a community to think about their own Christianity and how, how Christian are they, how they live their Christianity out, how authentic they are, just by hearing the witness of other people who you know, are, 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 are great examples of authenticity, listening to each other. That helps, that helps reform the institutions. Uh, and I don't see institution as a, as, a, as, a, as a negative word. I see the word simply as something that exists for a purpose, but it becomes encrusted with, encrusted with uh, a lot of things. Um, so that, that, that change that comes through dialogue, at the same time, I think each community has a responsibility to know and teach and form about ecumenism. It's a peculiar thing because most of the major advances in ecumenism have come from dialogue up here, people who are formed, people who have studied and seek the truth and so on. At the same time, it's coupled with the everyday lived experience of people living side by side. You know, the two things are interesting how they, how they work. So I think the communities have a responsibility and at the same time that ongoing, please God, increase in dialogue, listening, uh, helps conversion to give permission to conversion. The mere fact that one attends an ecumenical gathering with a good heart, that you're giving permission for conversion right there. You're giving permission. There's other things you could be doing. So... That, that's how I would respond to that uh, excellent interjection. Thank just you. To, just to add briefly that um, silence is really important in renewal. Um, silent retreats are good for personal renewal. Uh, the silence of communities is good for community renewal. I, I was so impressed when, when you had 15 extra minutes yesterday, you didn't say, go drink some more coffee. You said, let's pray. And I was so impressed by the freedom of this community to be able to do that. And just to pray, just to be in silence together, might give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to say something from time to time. <laughs> okay, thank you. We're gonna take one, we've got a choice. We can hear from Bishop Fred or we can take one more question. You have the power. <laughs> I have a question. I'm Ruth Jensen from the Alberta Synod. And I have a question for Bishop Fred. 
so he can have the last word. (laughs) (laughs) I have been so blessed by the conversation today, and I want to say thank you so much. It is just really wonderful. Also, I note that as life goes on, and I'm realizing I'm at the tail end of mine, most likely, and uh, that has become more real to me as I return to Canada, and, uh, oh, my goodness, everybody else has gotten so old, and then I look in, (laughs) 20 years later, you know, and you look in the mirror and you go, oh boy, okay, well, here it is. Words change meaning as we go along, and there's a couple of words, I'm, I'm directing this to you, Bishop Fred, because I was very interested in what everybody had to say, and I'd like to sit with you for the next day or two and talk, but I don't think that is what we can do. I'm interested in a couple of things, and that is taking a fresh look at evangelism, and uh, just curious about how we're defining evangelism, and I was touched by what you said, that evangelism Evangelism is designed to serve and not to conquer. And it was the word conquer that really struck me. Uh, So I would like you to kind of say a little bit more about that, if you would. And then there's a hymn that I just want to read the first verse to, because I think this is what we're looking at. And it's in 729 in in the Red Hymn Book, and it's, The church of Christ in every age, beset by sin, by change, but spirit-led, must claim and test its heritage and keep on rising from the dead. Mm. So I'll hear from you, Bishop, please. (laughs) (laughs) How many conventions have you been to? (laughs) Don't worry, we believe in a God who even when things are getting old, he makes all things new. Um, I I think that that sense of... um, uh, a sensitive evangelism. I mean, we have to confess the, the, the fact that uh, in the history of the church, uh, we have had movements that, in fact, have been designed to conquer. Inside our own country, we have had uh, the sad legacy of, um, of uh, the, um, the attitude toward the first peoples of, of this land, And I am personally uh, ashamed of of the the history in which the churches were engaged uh, in in saying, you know, that we have to uh, remove children from their evil surroundings and that we have to Christianize and civilize them. And in the process of doing that, uh, we we rob those children uh, of of their own spirituality uh, long before we came here, long before we, quote, discovered um, these parts. People were living here. They they had a social structure. They had family structures. They had they, they had uh, a spirituality which they practiced, and 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 sad to say through a federal government policy of assimilation. I could go on for this for, for quite a while, but a federal government policy of assimilation, the churches and, and some religious orders were agents of that, that policy. And, and we, as our former primate said, we try to remake you in our image. And, and, and what Michael Pierce said at the time was, uh, we failed you. We failed God and we failed ourselves. And so I think that, you know, we, we are, as Jordan, I think, was talking about earlier, we are coming to terms with that, that, uh, that legacy. And as a, as a, a nation that, that's, that's endorsed the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which includes a right to their own spirituality uh, and, and opportunities for uh, indigenous spirituality to find its way alongside the spirituality that we all embrace and, and mark through our liturgies and so on. Um, I, I think that uh, when I say conquering souls that we deem otherwise to be lost, that's in fact what we did. We deemed them to be lost. 
to, to live in evil surroundings, to have no sense of spirituality. And of course, what we're learning as we repent and humble ourselves is that uh, the First Nations peoples have much, in fact, to teach us about, about um, uh, respect for the Creator and about respect for how indeed you engage uh, one another in community, how you make decisions in circle, how, yes, you are silent while other people are speaking and you, you value stories and so on. So I think we're, you know, I, I speak from our, our own church. Our own church itself is, I think, and pray we're being actually reformed by coming to terms with the legacy, uh, making atonement for it, and saying we need to move forward uh, in, in a new and better way. I think the other thing that I would say just as a, a concluding comment would be that um, if there's one thing that, um, that, that, that I need to repent of, and perhaps my church needs to, and perhaps all the churches need to, it is this, that we have not always lived inside We've not always lived inside that holy conversation Jesus had with the disciples in the upper room. You know, we, we quickly describe that as the farewell discourse. And I've learned over the years through my reading and reflection on that discourse to not call it that, but rather to call it the abiding conversation into which Jesus continues to call the church. And sometimes his call, I think, is a plea. And that plea reaches its pinnacle, uh, I think, in, in his prayer. His prayer for himself and his own consecration to the will of God. His prayer for the disciples and their consecration. And his prayer for all those who, as he says, will come to believe through their word we're all gathered up in that prayer. And so I, I think that, I think as we look at the next 500 years, one of my hopes is that we'll in fact find ourselves as churches uh, spending much more time, as it were, inside that conversation and the teaching that, that, that is there. Because I think it's, it, it's the heart of the gospel. And as we all know, one of the big, big themes in that, in that conversation uh, is, is friendship. And I think as we've heard many of the panelists say, whether you're talking a relationship between an Orthodox patriarch and a Pope, or the President of the Lutheran World Federation, or friends across a table like this, or friends in local communities, it's that kind of effective relationship that we have with one another in Christ that will make our partnership in the gospel effective so the world will will come to know God's love and care. Dear friends, I want to thank you again for your willingness to be with us. This has been even richer than I imagined. Um, you have been many facets of the jewel of faith that we share and you have all sparkled in your own way, representing the traditions you come from, but I think even more the people that you are. And, and that has indeed blessed us and gifted us, and we look forward to your being with us again tonight. We now have some small gifts to give you um, as, as we leave and get on to the joy of announcements and coffee, uh, but um, just, just tokens to, to remind you of, of this time together and of our great love and respect for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.